How's that? One, two, three, one, two, three. There you go. Oh, yeah. One, two. That's probably too loud now. One, two, three. That's, that's good. Fine. That's what? good. Good? Okay. Wow. 20 dB gain. I don't know. The mic's right here. Oh, what a beautiful picture. Wow. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Mark Field Day 2008. Whose truck? Courtesy of Verizon. Oh, yeah. It says Verizon. Wow. And that, there's their beam on there. That's our, that's, um, uh, what was this call? There's me, in fact. There you go. Jim. Jim Biddle. Is that Bob on the other side? This is Dieter, Dieter Hauer. Yeah. That's Dieter at the uh, Mark Field Day. Is that a Kenwood 120? Uh, it looks like it, yeah. Yeah. Don't forget, this is 2008. We weren't very modern then. <laughs> Do you have trouble yeah. getting CW operators? I don't know. I'm one. Okay. <laughs> no, a lot of the clubs seem to have trouble finding CW operators for field day. Oh, okay. Well, I passed 20 words a minute Morris, in 1980, so I think I can act it. So it was pretty good having these. Uh, we had two of these trucks, actually, and they actually had generators on them. So we didn't worry oh, about anything. Isn't that called cheating? <laughs> No, it's field day. I mean, it's portable. Yeah, yeah. yeah I know. It's a Verizon truck. <laughs> here, here's our here's our lunch truck, and that's this is Lou right here, WX3I. Yeah. It's, this was a, a Verizon um, a training site on. Um, I can't remember exactly what road it's on, but it's out there in Trooper area anyway. Oh. Hmm. You get it on one of those power lines, you can operate uh, high power then. <laughs> so did somebody string a loop around those poles? Yeah, we we uh, used to hang uh, um, uh, inverted V's off the tower, off the uh, the bucket truck too. Here, we used to do that. It was Bob Haas W3SA that had a. In with Verizon, it would get us the truck. Actually, it was in with uh, Bella, Pennsylvania. It's how far back he went. But he would get us the trucks every year. Then we got thrown out of there. That was the end of that, sort of summarily. So we're very happy to be at the uh, Lower Providence Fire Company for the last couple of years. All right, enough of that. Stop share. Couple more minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll get started. Was it a difficult decision to do live ham fest at Kimberton? We kind of went back and forth on it uh, for a while, but we're hoping on things being better by July. Yeah, I think it's a safe bet. Yeah, that's the one thing you can't do by Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I and mean, hopefully vaccination numbers will continue to go up. I think case numbers will will fall. Yeah. We'll be in a much better place by then. How's the vaccination going as Villanova students? I don't really know how many. I think most of them have been getting vaccinated elsewhere because Pennsylvania has been a little behind a lot of other states, especially for uh, younger people. So I think a lot of folks just went back to their home states to get vaccinated. Is it available to them on campus? They do have some, they've had some vaccination drives, but it's been fairly limited so far. I think they've gotten like 1,500 people, but I think a lot of people have already gotten it, so. Just another minute or so, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Yeah, I got my first one uh, about two weeks ago, and then I go for the follow-up on May 14th. So I'll be done with that. Which one are you getting? A uh, Moderna. Okay. Unless they change it when you get there. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> well, my mother and I were going to get, I think it was Moderna, mm. two weeks ago yesterday, 
we get there and they say, oh, we're giving the Johnson and Johnson Tuesday morning. That was all the news. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I'm going for the second one. So I think that means I'm kind of uh, married to that. Yeah. Right. They don't mix them. All right. Should we get started here? It's, uh, recording. All right. So welcome, everyone. This is the April uh, meeting of the Mid-Atlantic Amateur Radio Club. So thanks, everyone, for uh, joining in and for the folks uh, watching on YouTube as well. So as we uh, normally do, we'll uh, begin with uh, a round of introductions. So my name is Jeremy N2ZLQ. I'm uh, the club president. So now if your call sign ends in, let's see, Alpha through Echo, you can check in now. Anybody? Hey, this is Fred, K2HA, and uh, we're doing fine here in Broomall, Pennsylvania. How about uh, Foxtrot through November? W3JNF, uh, Jim, in Springfield, Delaware County. Victor, you're uh, muted. We can't hear your audio. Yeah, it doesn't look like you're muted, but the microphone isn't working. All right, anybody else? Right. Sorry about that. It's uh, W3B, the I had kids screaming in the background. So right. I had to sign off real quick. Thanks. Anyone else to uh, check in? Like anybody, anybody or your letter? Anybody, any call signs. Oh, this is Ned WQ3Z. Am I making the machine? You are making this machine. Yes. Dennis K3DS. This is a Dave WB3EHS in Malvern. Bob W3REC in Exton. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Lou isn't here tonight. I don't have the latest uh, treasurer's report. Uh, so let's uh, go on to uh, secretary and uh, membership services. Jim, anything to report? Uh, nothing to report as secretary. Uh, I don't have the exact number of members, but it's uh, between 72 and 74, I believe, at this point. Yeah, I think that's the last I saw as of last week. I think we were at 74. Right. And the bank balance last month was about 16K, so we're probably right around that. There's been nothing big uh, in or out. Okay. Do you have an update for uh, field day? Field day. Field day is on. Uh, we got confirmation for the site uh, through Lou, who is a member of the fire company there. So uh, what that will uh, field day we set up on the 25th of June. A few of us get there, not everybody, but a few of us get there. We don't really set up. We, you know, pull down and get every the furniture ready. And then on the 26th, uh, when it's uh, appropriate to set up, uh, we'll need, you know, some people to help. As far as uh, limiting uh, people there, hopefully we won't have to at that point, but obviously masks and social distancing, I would think would still be in effect. So, uh, you know, it's something we're all living with now and I don't see a problem uh, at field day. Um, other than that, right now it's, it's a little premature, but that's pretty much where we're at. It's on. All right. Thanks, Jim. Sounds great. And also see on uh, YouTube, we have uh, Steve KS3K, our uh, past vice president. Uh, he's checking in as well. All right. So uh, Bob is unable to be here uh, tonight. He's actually at a meeting of the parade commission. Uh, they're talking about the uh, Radnor Memorial Day parade. So that's uh, one of our big events for the spring that we do for public service. So I guess as we speak right now, they're deciding whether or not they're going to be holding the uh, Memorial Day Parade in Radnor. And if so, whether we'll be uh, helping out with that. 
So I think uh, Bob said he'll probably have an update uh, for the net uh, tomorrow evening. Mm -hmm. We'll find out more about uh, whether that event is happening. I uh, also want to talk a little bit about the Ham Fest. So uh, Bob N3JIZ is also our Ham Fest chair. So he wanted me to pass along a few announcements here. So our Ham Fest is confirmed for July 17th. It'll be at Kimberton, which is our uh, usual site. And we are planning on the full uh, complement. We'll have the food truck, uh, VE testing. We'll have a QSL card uh, checker. Uh, we will be needing uh, quite a bit of help uh, from the membership. So we will be uh, reaching out over the next uh, month or two to uh, try to uh, solicit as much support as possible. So we'll be putting in the application with uh, ARRL. So it'll be published in uh, QST, hopefully the issue that comes out in uh, mid-June and hopefully it'll be on the website uh, somewhat sooner than that. Uh, so we are setting up a special hamfest at mark-radio.org email. So Dennis is in the process of getting that set up. So that will uh, help to kind of filter everything through a uh, single point of uh, contact for the hamfest preparation. So we're hoping that's gonna go very well. I mean, hopefully conditions will be a lot better uh, COVID wise by then. You know, that's kind of our assumption uh, going into this. And we're hoping that maybe there's a lot of uh, latent interest that people have been cooped up over the last year. So we'll get uh, quite a few people interested in uh, going out and getting some deals. You know, the Ham Fest is largely outdoors and even the indoor portion, we can open up those, uh, the big uh, doors on the side. We can get a fair bit of airflow uh, through there. Again, if you have any suggestions or ideas, you can contact me or Bob or eventually this uh, ham fest at uh, markradio.org uh, once that's set up. All right, so next up, uh, technical services. Uh, Dennis, you have an update? Now you're muted. Um, the uh, Darby repeater is still offline. I did get my shots. I waited my two weeks. I have to get a COVID screening test. They don't believe you even with the vaccination. And um, I am waiting till I finish up my current job, which is going to be this week and next. And after that, I'll be footloose and fancy free. And we'll be making obviously multiple visits down there as we try to get the uh, repeater, probably a uh, new repeater online uh, for the uh, Darby location. All other machines are running except um, the uh, 220 repeater at Bryn Mawr Hospital is going in and out and someday we'll have to probably just take it down because nobody's really using it per se. Back to you. All right, thanks Dennis. Hopefully we'll get uh, those Darby machines uh, back up in the near future. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, nets. Uh, we're continuing to run our nets on Wednesday and Sunday evening at 8.30 p.m. Typically getting about 10 to 15 check-ins, so it's a nice, uh, you know, sort of a laid back net. Uh, people get a little bit of a chance to talk. It's not like uh, some nets where you check in and that's the end of that. Usually we're having uh, some pretty good conversations on the net. Uh, our net control operators recently have included uh, Cliff, KC3, PGT. Uh, we've had uh, Alex, KC3, MBV has done a couple of uh, nets recently. And uh, our newest uh, net control operator is Herb. Uh, Herb is... Uh, which is called K3YR. He's been doing uh, quite a few nets as well. So I encourage you to join us if you haven't been to a, a net recently. That's on our 147.06 in Newtown Square and our 145.13 over in uh, Paoli. So again, that's Wednesday and Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Uh, we also have an informal uh, drive time net, which has been going on Mondays through Fridays around 4 to 4.30 p.m. So Bob and Jim and a few other folks have typically been on there. So if you're putting out your call on the repeater and not getting a response, well, that's a good time to check in. Around 4 to 4.30, you'll typically find somebody uh, on there. Usually a pretty friendly, uh, informal uh, kind of a net, more of a round table, just people uh, shooting the breeze for a while. A couple of other nets going on. Uh, Philmont Club does a drive time net uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. That's on their 147.03 repeater. So that's been a pretty busy net. So that's every day uh, at 5 p.m. And of course, our sister club, uh, Marple Newtown, uh, they run their nets 8.30 a.m. Uh, I think every day of the year, maybe other than Christmas Day, although I haven't been around to check. But they're uh, every day of the week, they're uh, weather and information net. And that's on 147.195. All right. So at that point, does anyone else have anything uh, for the club? 
Yeah, Ned. <clears throat> Two questions. First off, do we know anything about the um, the Kimberton Fair? Uh, there's been no word on that yet, but we we will not be providing service for the Kimberton Fair. There, we're not going to be doing that. Oh shoot! I like that. My kid <laughs> likes that. Well, I guess you could show up if you want, <laughs> but we're not being asked to provide uh, service as part of the uh, as part of the deal. So, are we paying for the site, or what's the? Yeah, so we're, we're going to be paying for the site. How much is that? Uh, it's one thousand. Okay. So, so we have to move some serious, make some serious um, space sales. So you're going to have to be pushing the, uh, getting people to buy stuff. Okay. And second off, um, I need to get a replacement magnet mount mobile two meter antenna. What, what What's everybody's suggestions? I suggest a Larson. That, that's a, I have Larson and it's much better than what I've had before. Do they make any mag mounts? Yes. They do. I thought everything they sold was NMO, so then you'd need an NMO uh, mag well, mount. Well, well it's, it, the, uh, it's an NMO mag mount. OK. I mean, that's what I have. I don't know. OK, what's, they, N they M what's NMO? It's NMO uh, is the 3 quarter inch uh, okay, mount. OK. OK. Right. okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for something a little smaller and more inexpensive, MFJ sells a, it's like a 19 inch whip that does two meters and 440 with a mag mount. I think the whole thing, including the coax is like 40 bucks. Well, and it frank, 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 well. Frankly, I'm looking to get, a, get as much reasonable gain as I can short of having a tower. If you're gonna go with the MFJ, I've got some uh, a wire, um, Hangers in the closet. I'll give you a couple. Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> I agree with. I, I agree, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, but if, if you're looking for something low profile, you know, a 19 inch, so it's not sticking up too far, that might be the way to go. As Another say, brand which is pretty good, I think, is Diamond. Though Diamond makes a great uh, yeah. dual band. But... Okay. Diamond and Larson. It, it's hard to uh, go bad with those. Is that going to be a? Um... HRO purchase. You could get HRO, DX engineering, pretty much any of them will have that. Right. I'd be careful about Amazon because usually their stuff is either inexpensive or it's knockoff stuff that's of unknown mm -hmm. quality. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else uh, before we go on to the uh, main speaker? All right, so here we go. So I've been looking forward to this uh, for uh, for some time. Our invited speaker tonight is uh, Barry Fearman, uh, K3 EUI. So I've known Barry for, uh, what do you say, about seven or eight years now, maybe even a little longer. I actually know him through a physics teacher's organization because that's uh, we share a profession. And I think we were uh, on the way out to the parking lot after one of the meetings, and then I noticed all the antennas on his car, and he noticed antennas on mine. And we kind of put two and two together and realized that we uh, share another interest as well. So Barry's an excellent teacher and uh, great at explaining things. So I thought he would be the best guy to come here and tell us about using uh, nano VNA for amateur radio. So take it away, Barry. Okay. Um, let's see if I press share screen, am I able to share at this point? You should be able to. Okay, that came up. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Is that full size now? Yeah, that's good. All righty. All right, good evening. Thank you for the invitation to come back. Uh, I've been to a couple of the live meetings, so Zoom is a little awkward in a way. I was a high school teacher for over 40 years, and I like to see who I'm talking to, and uh, I would like to add, uh, if you have a question, uh, just please interrupt right away, just unmute, call out the question. I won't see if you raise your hand or do one of those symbol things, because uh, I'll be paying attention elsewhere. But um, this is a huge topic, and one about a year ago I knew absolutely nothing about, a VNA. I've never, I never used one. 
in my professional life as a physics instructor, I'd use oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, all kinds of instrumentation, but never a vector network analyzer. My background was more in astrophysics than in uh, electronics. So uh, I gave a talk uh, last summer, very similar to a topic I think I talked about once for you folks on antennas, antenna tuners, impedance matching, well, stuff about antennas. And one of the uh, listeners at the Philmont talk said, have you experimented with this little new gadget called a nano VNA? I said, no, I have no idea what it is. This was a year ago. So uh, he sent me one. He bought me one and sent me one. And it arrived, and I thought, what is this? I didn't, I didn't buy this. Anyway, a little note, you know. And so I contacted the person who uh, gifted this to me. And I said, what's, the, what's this for? He said, well, a couple of us have these, and we're not sure how to use them. And we figured if we chipped in and bought you, you one, you'd learn how to use it, then you could teach us. I thought, oh, isn't that quaint? Is that the deal? He said, yeah, that's the deal. So the next uh, month or so, I played with it, and I learned a little bit about it. And uh, I finally learned enough to give what I would call for uh, Philmont a third grade understanding of a nano VNA, and they appreciated that. But I kept digging into it. I uh, contacted some people who know a whole lot more about this and felt more confident and... Uh, learned a little more about not so much what's inside the electronics, but how you could use it as a tool. So I'd like to concentrate this into uh, two parts. <laughs> if you invite me back for the second part, we'll see how, how part one goes. So part one, I'm trying to avoid the mathematics stuff and just look at, you know, what is this as a tool in your toolbox? Um, and in part two, if you'd like me to come back for May, I'd like to delve into the kind of the under the hood stuff. Uh, how does it really work? What's, uh, what's reflection coefficient? What's a return loss? How do you measure it? Uh, throw in some stuff about Smith charts, which I had to relearn. Anyway, a little bit deeper understanding, maybe a 10th grade understanding. So I'm gonna aim at the basics uh, right now. So um, thank you for the invite. I hope I can at least get through the uh, the basics of this. I also sent uh, Jeremy a PDF of all the slides I put together on this topic. Um, way, way too much stuff, but I didn't know what questions might pop up, so I always kind of overdo the research end. All right, so uh, let's go on with this. Let's see. So I thought right away, uh, these things last summer were about $50, $60 on Amazon and some other places. I thought, well, yeah, it's a $50 tool. What, what would I compare it to? And I thought right away of uh, a Swiss army knife because when I was about 12 years old and a Boy Scout, I got these as a, uh, one of these army knives as a birthday present. And I thought, oh, this is way cool. And I'd go camping, you know, with all the other scouts and I'd always have my Swiss army knife. But in reality, I only use one or two of the blades, you know, the can opener and the main knife. I had all these other things, and I thought, you know, I don't need a nail clipper and a file and a, a corkscrew. I don't know what you'd use that for anyway. Uh, the scissors, you know, but I thought, this is just really cool. But uh, this little Nano VNA is a lot like the Swiss Army knife. Uh, it can do a lot of things if you know how to use it. And again, they're both about 50 bucks, give or take. And I thought, well, you know, it's also like a stethoscope. Uh, as I got older and had some heart issues, I had to learn a lot more about how heart disease happens and what you can do to help prevent it. Um, we had a couple of uh, stethoscopes that was fun to listen to your heart. And actually, our grandkids have more fun listening to their stomachs than our hearts. But uh, in a way, this gadget is like a stethoscope if you know how to interpret, you know, the thump, 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 tells you something about your heart health uh, or your digestion health. <laughs> More fun. So yeah, it's sort of like uh, another tool, like a stethoscope. Then I thought, let's take this one step farther. Um, 
I'm at the stage now every year I go to see my cardiologist. I had a problem in 2008. And the first thing is, you know, I get an EKG. And I thought, well, I want to learn how to read these EKGs. So I read up on how EKGs work. And, you know, the technician would come in and strap me with, you know, eight or ten leads. And zip, zip, zip. And out prints a uh, EKG of my heart. She puts it on the table. And when the doc walks in, I've already looked at it. And uh, the doc knows me pretty well, <laughs> retired physics professor, you know. So I say, uh, how about if I read my own uh, EKG and you tell me how I'm doing? He said, go for it. <laughs> so, so I take a minute and, you know, and I, I know the basics of it, you know. And I read out the EKG and I said, uh, actually, my heart looks in pretty good shape from this. How did I do? He said, uh, not bad for a third grader. I said, oh, that's kind of a compliment. So uh, he said, uh, you know, you're looking at the amplitude. Um, you need to look at the phase. I thought, oh, man, phase, phase, phase. It's the same with antennas, isn't it? So each year when I uh, read my own EKG, I try to impress him that, you know, I, I know a little bit more about the, the timing, the phase between the different pulses and the recovery time and so on. So I thought, well, yeah, you know, this nano VNA can give you a lot of information, but are you sharp enough to interpret it? So that's what I want to concentrate on, at least for this first session. Um, how do I use this as just another tool in the toolbox? Now, it looks a little different from the other tools here. I'll, I'll admit to that. So I had a lot of fun learning how to use mine. Uh, they're kind of delicate. I had a fear of dropping it. So I'm really careful, and one sitting here next to me. I hope I don't uh, let it land on the floor. So uh, part two, if we get to that next May, I want to look at a little bit more, well, a lot more detail. Uh, how do you calibrate this? What, why do you have to calibrate it? Let's take a look at how impedance shows up on a Smith chart. Uh, the difference between resonant frequency and the lowest SWR. Hams often confuse those two. They're not the same thing. And when your antenna has reactants, like my 80 meter dipole off frequency, how do you cancel that? And how does the nano VNA help me figure out how to do that or figure out how to make an antenna tuner and get your antenna to work over the entire 80 meter band from inside your house? So that's part two. I'm not going to get to that tonight. So uh, I thought right away, you know, this is a lot like uh, other things we're more familiar with or I was more familiar with. Uh, I lived at West Town School, a Quaker co-ed boarding school outside of Westchester. We have a large lake and a lake house, and there are bats that live in the lake house in the uh, attic. <laughs> and they come out at night, and it's kind of fun to go down to the lake and watch when the bats come out right after sunset. And they emit these high-frequency chirps, about 80 kilohertz. Now, this is sound, not RF, right? But 80,000 hertz, that means the wavelength's real, real small. In fact, small enough to bounce off insects. So the bats find their food by chirping. And these little insects uh, create enough of a reflection surface so the bat gets an echo and with two ears can, you know, locate the insect and go scoop it up. So I guess bats that had better, what, hearing probably ate a little better and maybe reproduced a little more. So bats have real good hearing at these high frequencies. Uh, if they would try to emit a low sound like, whoa, it wouldn't bounce off an insect. So their, their hearing is very acute at the higher pitch, way, way higher than humans can hear. Dolphins, well, it's fun listening to the dolphin sounds. Now, again, this is sound, but dolphins can locate other objects underwater, like food or other dolphins. Uh, and, of course, submarines, you know, ping, ping, subs can find other things underwater including other subs. So, well, all that's sound, but it's sort of like doing the same thing. It's emitting some energy and seeing what comes back. If nothing comes back, you kind of infer, well, there's nothing out there. You're not getting an echo. So the VNA does that with uh, RF, and it just sends out a very, very small signal, something like a milliwatt or less, sends it on a feed line, and let's say you connect the feed line to an antenna rather than through, like to a uh, filter or an amplifier or something. What happens if you hook up this VNA to an antenna through a feed line? 
Well, if the antenna is working really well, it should take all that energy and radiate it. There shouldn't be anything coming back towards the VNA. But if the SWR is anything other than perfect, you're going to get some reflected energy. So the feed line has sort of a signal going one way and a signal going the other way. And this VNA is clever enough inside to separate the forward and the backwards voltages, reflected voltages, and determine all kinds of parameters from that. So we'll take a look at how that actually works. Um, this is about as complicated a slide as I wanted to get in terms of what's in the VNA, Vector Network Analyzer. There's a source, so it's a little transmitter, and um, you know it can go up to uh, gigahertz frequencies even at the uh, small price range. So it sends a signal out to some sort of a device under test, a DUT. Only an engineer would come up with a term like a DUT. Device under test. Uh, some of that signal can go through the device, filter and amplifier. In the case of an antenna, nothing's going through. We hope it's all radiating. But what comes through can be then sent back to the device, the nano VNA, and examine uh, that on a second port. So these VNAs have at least two ports. One's a transmitter and then listens for its own reflection. And the other's the through going to a second input. So these uh, nano VNAs have to be uh, very critically uh, calibrated at certain frequencies, which I'll show you how to do. But basically then it goes into a comparator. You measure the voltages in, the voltages out. You can see uh, any phase delays. So from that, you can determine all sorts of parameters. I'm simplifying greatly the electronics in here just to say it's doing a comparison of one voltage to another. Uh, the most common question I've gotten from uh, others who are learning about this is, well, how is it different from a spectrum analyzer? Well, they both look pretty intimidating. They both, uh, in the professional level, cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But uh, a network analyzer sends out a pulse and then looks at what happens to that pulse. So the network analyzers are a little transmitter and then a receiver. The spectrum analyzers are just good receivers. And they can slice and dice the spectrum and, if you need to, demodulate it and see all sorts of detail. Uh, they serve two different purposes, although I can see why there's some confusion here. So when I started to look at vector network analyzers on the web, I found all kinds of interesting looking gadgets. And again, even as a physics teacher, I never got to play with any of this stuff. But this one costs about as much as my automobile, so it's a wonder I didn't have one of these in my shack. Um, but the vector network analyzer has at least two ports, and it sends signals out and then looks at what happens when the signals come through or back. And it dissects that very carefully at very high uh, accuracy, and in this case goes up to 6 gigahertz. Here's one I came across, and I thought, oh my gosh, look at this thing. i got to get a picture of this for my slideshow. Uh, it goes up to 20 gigahertz, uh, that's way up there, and uh, can display uh, all of these graphs in color. It's got four ports. The ins and outs can be reversed. It's just, you know, got everything you can imagine. And I was giving this talk uh, about uh, two months ago to the Pentagon Amateur Radio Club. Yeah, the Pentagon, the Pentagon Amateur Radio Club. You know, I'm giving them a third grader understanding of but anyway, one of the guys interrupts me and says, uh, I use this. And I said, you use this VNA? He said, yeah. I said, I must be at work. What do you do that use this? He said, well, I align the radar systems on F-22 Raptor fighter jets out at Andrews Air Force Base. I thought, oh my gosh, wow, that's really neat. So what, what do you think of this? He says, it's a very high precision, high accuracy instrument. I said, well, do you take it home to check out your antennas? He said, no, first the Navy wouldn't let me do that. But he said, besides that, I don't like to mix pleasure and work. <laughs> so I thought, so cool, so cool. Look at this thing. All right, so I have to talk about this little gadget tonight, uh, the Nano VNA. But it's amazing, it can do so many different things at a very, very inexpensive price. And it does them really, at least the one I have, with very high accuracy. If at least I'm on the HF bands. You get up into the gigahertz range, I don't do that. And then you've got more serious issues. So it's a very nice, easy 
to operate, uh, you know, nano just means small, uh, vector network analyzer. It's got two ports. I'd call them port one and two. So someone calls them channel zero, <laughs> channel one. Again, kind of an engineer making this thing up. Um, so it has a lot of potential, a lot of capability here. It, it can display on one small color screen four different graphs in four different colors. Well, I'm not impressed. I'm red, green, color blind, so I get mixed up. And the greens and the yellows kind of look alike, and I don't see purple at all. So uh, I didn't have too much fun with this. Um, probably its biggest limitation, and it's getting better every month, is the amount of memory it has. So it can do a calibration with about 100 data points. Oh, that's fine if you're looking at 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters. But if I want to test something, uh, you know, from 420 to 450 megahertz, I'd want more data points. So that's one of the problems with the built-in memory. You can, however, with a USB, hook it up to a computer. And that's the way I learned to do it. And uh, it was much better for me because I can mix the colors, the ones I can see. The internal battery, lithium battery, is good for a couple hours. So with a USB cable, you can recharge the battery and or connect it to your computer. Uh, the cables are usually SMA on the ends here. I mean, the uh, sockets are SMA. Some of the newer ones, I think, have uh, N female uh, sockets. But the small, simple ones still have uh, SMA connectors. Um, so you can get adapters that go from SMA over to the more standard, you know, SO239 cable. Another 10 bucks. Now here's something that I want to talk about in more detail in the second talk in May. But just to say, these things have to be calibrated. Unlike my little MFJ antenna analyzer and the rig expert and so on. Um, what do you mean calibrate? It needs to know from one socket to the other socket what would be a direct short, what would be an infinite resistance, and what would be 50 ohms, no reactance. So the three standards that are used to calibrate this are called a short, just what it means, short circuit inside, and open, the pin and the uh, shield don't touch, and the load is a reasonably high precision, high accuracy, uh, 50 ohm non-inductive resistor. So that's the expensive part. If you don't do a calibration over the frequency range you want to use, this thing is almost useless. So that's kind of a warning. So why would I want one of these? <laughs> I thought, well, if I'm giving a talk on this thing, I better, why would I want one of these? Well, I didn't buy it. It was given to me. But now that I've got one, I'm very glad that uh, these Philmont guys chipped in and bought me one because I've learned a lot about all kinds of stuff that I didn't know about before, a year ago. So let's say I want to use it to measure coax cable. I want to see uh, what's the length of this cable and does it have any bad short spots in it? It's old coax. So I hook it up to channel zero and send a signal out, and I wait until the signal comes back. Now, I used to be able to show this on an oscilloscope, send a pulse down a cable, and depending on the length of the cable, basically um, electric waves, mag you know, an RF wave goes through a piece of cable about 80%, 70% the speed of light. So about one foot in a nanosecond. That's kind of a rough guideline. So I thought, all right, let's try it. So you can set this th thing up for what's called a time domain reflection. And basically, uh, this slide is way more complicated than I need, but you hook up your nano VNA over here, and you hook up coax, some unknown amount. And at the end, I just shorted the pin in the braid. Uh, so I made a direct short at the end. So what happens if a signal goes out over 50 feet of coax and hits a dead short? Well, it's not going to absorb anything in a zero re you know, resistance. So the wave just reflects. And it comes back through the cable. It comes back into here. And this device can measure two things. The time it took for the wave to go out and come back. And it can also measure, well, what's the reduction in intensity, the voltage reduction? So when it does that, I can determine if there's any breaks in the cable. And I can also determine at whatever frequency I'm testing, uh, what's the attenuation of the cable. So here I hooked it up to a random piece of coax that's behind me here. It's about 50, 60 feet of RG8X. I just had it lying around. 
So I hook it up to the uh, Nano VNA, and I thought, all right, I click on Time Domain Reflection, and I set it over a frequency range, I forget what I did, like 1 to 30 megahertz or something. And in about 10 seconds, boom, came up with this graph on the computer monitor. This is not on the little device screen. This is on the computer monitor running the software called Nano VNA Saver. So here it is. Whoa, big pulse, 17 meters. Well, that's about, what, 55 feet or so. How did it know it was uh, 17 meters? Well, because I said this is Belden 9258 coax. And in the software, it knew that velocity factor was about 82%, the speed of light. So, sends a pulse down, boom, gets, and look, there's no, nothing happening before that. So, I don't have a break in the cable, I knew that. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Could I use this on six meters? I'm thinking about hooking up a six meter dipole in my backyard about 100 feet away. So, I thought, well, let's do now an attenuation test. So, I send a signal out the port, and then what comes back, I look at the strength, and I change the frequency, and it does this rapidly from 1 megahertz out to 100 megahertz. And here's what I get back. So this is called return loss. I'm losing something. But it's still the reflected energy. I'm just using one port. Send a ping down the cable. Listen to what comes back. So there's about a half a dB loss. That's nothing. At uh, 1 megahertz. Well, I can't operate a handband there. So let's take a look at 80 meters. Yeah, still about half a decibel loss. So wouldn't worry about that. 40 meters, about 7 megahertz, about 1 decibel loss. Well, that's nothing. That's like, what, 10, 11 percent or something. You, no one would ever know a 1 dB loss. So I could use this cable for a 40 meter dipole. How about 10 meters? Uh, 2 dB loss. Oh, that's something like 20 percent, isn't it? No. Or was that the one that's 37 percent? I forget these logarithms. But uh, I'd probably not worry about a 2 dB loss. It's a fraction of an S unit. How about 6 meters up here, 50 megahertz? Well, no, wait a minute now. Now I'm down to a 3 dB loss. I remember 3 dB. That's kind of magic, right? 3 dB, that's 50% loss. Well, in voltage, that's what, a 25% loss in power. I don't think I'd want to use this on 6 meters. Why not? Oh, well, I'm wasting half the energy in the coax. Why do that? But, you know, I could sell it to a CB operator or something. Certainly wouldn't use it up here on uh, 2 meters or 440, but it's, you know, it's the cheap RG8X cable. So that was kind of cool. I could figure out how to use the VNA to test some old cable. Now, in my basement, I have 100 feet of RG8, and it uh, has the manufacturer's name on it, Amphenol. And it also has a date, and it says June 1941. Yes, June 1941. It's older than I am. I thought, oh, man, I've got to test this. Well, I look at the shield. It's bright, shiny, and the loss was almost nothing on 80 meters. Wow, I thought, that's really cool. It's, uh, you know, 80-year-old coax, uh, but it was never out in the rain to get, you know, soaking wet and all. So that's uh, pretty good. I don't want to use it. I like to save it. So how about measuring other things? Well, as a physics teacher, I was always teaching the kids how you measure inductance and capacitance. Uh, you know, they start to get an idea about reactance and impedance in high school, but we don't go too much in detail. But you can use this with different uh, kinds of circuits. You can measure resistance, reactance, impedance, phase, and depends on how complicated you want to get as to what you're measuring. I just found that online and I thought, oh, it's pretty cool. Jeremy will probably recognize some of these formulas here. Um, okay, so how would hams use this gadget? Well, I check out filters. I already thought about that. Check out my coax. So uh, all kinds of things about antennas. So let's check out some stuff about filters. So before we look at filters, uh, how do filters work? So all right, quick digression. Uh, coils and capacitors. So hams know about this stuff. Physics people know about this stuff. Sometimes our wording is a little different. But what's an inductor? Well, it's just a coil, right? So when current goes through a coil, it generates a magnetic field. But what happens when you reverse the direction of the current, AC rather than DC? Oh, now you got a problem. <laughs> if you reverse the direction, the magnetic field has to collapse to zero and then build up in the other direction. Then you reverse the current again. So every time the current reverses direction, if it's AC rather than DC, 
this thing is going to oppose that change. So you get into something called uh, inductive reactance, just a fancy word for it doesn't want to do that. It's a kind of a resistance for AC. But coils behave that way. Well, that's understanding. So what's easier to pass, a low frequency or a high frequency through a coil? Oh, a low frequency. So coils are often defined as they'll block the high frequencies and they'll pass the low frequencies. So when you look at inductive reactance, X sub L, resistance, that increases in direct proportion to the frequency. And also it's related to, you know, the inductance, the number of coils here, how close they are, and some other stuff. But anyway, inductors. Inductors react very poorly to high frequencies. They block them. Well, how about capacitors? Well, it's interesting. Capacitors work on a different principle. Um, the low frequencies can't get through the capacitor, but the high frequencies can. And when I say get through, it's not literally through, but when I taught ninth graders, I said, come up with an example of how a capacitor can pass an AC current. And my ninth graders were very, very creative. So they had this big box that looked like an old refrigerator box with two holes in the box. And their skit was they would take a, like a green colored tennis ball and throw it in one of the holes in the box. And a moment later, a blue tennis ball would come out the other side of the box. So every time they threw in one tennis ball of one color, a tennis ball of a different color came out the other side. Well, beautiful. What they're showing was the same electron doesn't go through the capacitor, right? Uh, the capacitor has an insulator, uh, dielectric. But basically what they're showing is, you know, one electron in, a different electron out. If you do it really fast, the capacitor doesn't have time to sort of like overcharge. Very clever. But capacitive reactance decreases decreases as the frequency goes up. That's the opposite of an inductor. All right, so far. So what happens when you get a capacitor that has a reactance graph like this, 1 over 2 pi Fc, an inductor that has a reactance that's linear, 2 pi Fl, but at some frequency, these two just uh, will cross. Ah, well, that's the magic point. That's what I was trying to teach to the high school kids. Where is that magic point? Uh, we would use sound rather than use RF. It's much safer. So let's see here. If we take a coil and a capacitor and hook them up side by side, parallel, they behave one way. If we take the same capacitor and coil and hook them up end to end in series, they behave very differently. So the tuned circuit, as we're going to look at with the VNA, depends on how you hook these up. The formula is the same. That is based on the L and the C and 1 over 2 pi business. If you know the L and the C, you can figure out the F. Or if you know the F and the L, you can figure out the C. And we played that game with uh, ninth graders taking physics. They loved that. All right, so let's look at this simple circuit. The current's got to go through both of these. Well, we know, wait a minute, low frequencies can't get through the capacitor. So that offers a lot of resistance. High frequencies can't get through the coil. That offers a lot of resistance. But there's some mid-level resonant frequency that can get through both. So at resonance, the combined resistance of these two is a minimum, and we just call it impedance. If you're sending a current through this with a battery or with an AC generator, anything, you find that at resonance, the current's maximum. So that's just something to keep in mind here. In a series circuit, at resonance, the current is a maximum because the resistance of the impedance is minimum. All right, well, how about if we hook them up in parallel? What's the difference? <laughs> Big difference. So now low frequencies, when they come through here, they have a choice. There's two paths. Low frequencies try to get through the capacitor. Nope, won't work. But now they try to get through the coil, the inductor. Oh, that's pretty easy. So low frequencies tend to go through the inductor and, and through the rest of the circuit. High frequencies try to get through the coil. Nope. A lot of resistance there, but high frequencies can get through the capacitor. So you see basically that having two choices, the low frequencies and the high frequencies both get blocked. <laughs> right? So what's going on? I mean, the low frequencies and the high frequencies both can get through. <laughs> but the middle frequency can't get through either very well. So at resonance, the impedance is the highest. Highest, what does that mean? The current's the lowest. 
keep that in mind when we look at nano VNA and filters. Sorry, I messed that up. Okay, so in resonance, we have an L and a C. How can the nano VNA help us? So I thought, well, let's pull some stuff out of my junk box. So I found this. This is a Drake low pass filter. Very, very popular when uh, ham radio transmitters weren't quite so clean. And I had my novice in 1958. I had a Heathkit DX100, and I was getting into neighbor's televisions. Not so good for a 13-year-old. So I added a little device to the output of the Heathkit transmitter called a low-pass filter. Might have been this one. I'm not sure. And lo and behold, the television interference stopped. I thought, all right, I got to pull this out of my junk box. I still had it in my closet back here. Hook it up to my Nano VNA. Let's see why this worked so well. So if you open it up, well, it's just passive parts. Coils and capacitors. Coils and capacitors. Three stages here. Oh, well, the capacitor's here. The capacitor's going to ground. So I guess any, what, high frequencies can get from here through here into the ground. Low frequencies can pass through the coils with some difficulty. So low frequencies can get through here. High frequencies get bypassed the ground. So that's why it's called a low-pass filter. has a name back here, Drake Low-Pass Filter. All right, so here it is. Here's my little nano VNA. So I hook up one side of the nano VNA through some coax input. The other side I hook up through another coax to the uh, channel one. So I'm now measuring the through signal, what engineers call the S21. It's just looking at the uh, output on one socket, the input on the other. So what kind of energy gets through here? Well, what, I want, what do I want to test? Well, I want to test all frequencies. So I scan from 1 megahertz to 100 megahertz. And look what I get, the S21, the gain, 0 dB. Well, it's not an amplifier, but it's not attenuating either, 0 dB. Nothing gained, nothing lost. 0 dB at 10 megahertz, 20, 30. So all the HF bands go through here unimpeded, right? But when it gets to about position 4, that's about 30 about 35 megahertz or so, something magic happens here. Look at this boom. So when I'm down here to uh, 50 megahertz, the attenuation is negative 80 dB gain. Well, the gain is negative 80. It means it's attenuating 80 dB. That's, that's 100 million, right? 80, yeah, 60 is a million. So 80, 80 dB is 100 million times less energy getting through this thing at 50 megahertz, and, and it stays constant all the way up through 100, 200, 300, 400 megahertz. So none of the TV signals, I'm talking about the old analog TV channels, none of those signals, uh, those frequencies, get through my filter. So if this is following my transmitter, and then my antenna is connected at the other end, hey, that's pretty good. I'm not going to transmit any signals that you know, will come up on TV channel 7 or something. So I thought, oh, that was kind of fun. Uh, you know, I had this this filter for years and years, and I kind of knew roughly how it worked, but here I could measure it. And it also says on it, 80 dB attenuation above 41 megahertz. So it's true. Nothing worn out here. I thought, oh, that was worth the 50 bucks all by itself. Then I thought, well, let's dig up some other things in my junk box. And I found this, and I thought, I don't, I don't even know what this is. It's obviously a coil and a capacitor. So I thought, oh, I remember why I, and I think I picked this up at Kimberton about 20 years ago or something. It says 25 MMF, 25 Mickey, 25 micro micro farad. So there's a capacitor inside a coil. Uh, what is this gadget? Well, it's kind of obviously a parallel circuit. So here's what it looks like on the outside. I thought, oh, I'm going to test this on my nano VNA. So again, I hook up my coax, strip a little uh, center conductor, put it here, short the shield, put the center conductor of the other side. So whatever is going to go through this, I'm going to pick up on my nano VNA. Well, it's again a parallel circuit, right? So what's going to happen? Well, what should happen in a parallel circuit? So here's the way I did it with the two coax connectors. I wasn't so worried about the sloppy, you know, shorted shield here. I'm only at low frequency HF anyway. Wouldn't do this at gigahertz range. So here's what I'm doing. I'm passing the signal from channel one through this little parallel LC circuit 
and then measuring what comes through it to channel two. Or actually, they're channel zero and channel one, but you get the idea. So what should happen at the resonant frequency? This should be what? A high impedance, right? At the resonant frequency, whatever it is, that RF can't get through either device. It's a real high impedance. Lower than resonance, ah, not a problem. Go through the uh, coil. Higher than resonance, nah, not a problem. Get through the capacitor. So remember, this is at resonance, a high impedance, only at the resonant frequency. Let's find out. Hook it up and boom. Oh, again, this is on VNA saver. So here it's uh, looking 3 megahertz. Oh, very little loss, you know, a couple dB here at 3 megahertz. But look what happens when you get to about 14 megahertz. Oh, man, look at this loss. Nothing's getting through it. The, uh, the gain is negative 65 dB, <laughs> so it's a loss, right? So a 65, that's more than a million times. Very little energy at uh, 20 meters, 14 megahertz, is getting through this. But how about the higher frequencies? You know, up here, uh, 20 megahertz, uh, 30 megahertz. Well, they're getting through, you know, the uh, coil, and these, frequency, uh, these frequencies are getting through the capacitor, and the lower frequencies are getting through the inductor. But right at the resonant frequency, boom. So how can I use this? Oh, I know. This is the typical trap. And I bought it because I wanted to build a little dipole and have a 20-meter trap. So a trap isolates the 20-meter band. Oh, I'm digging more in my junk box, and I come up with this. This is actually a very nice piece of equipment. A comet. Now, they call it a duplexer, but I think it should be called a diplexer. Duplexers are what you put on repeaters. Anyway, uh, here's the common. And then it says this port, 1.3 to 170 megahertz. So HF up to... 170 megahertz, and this port, ah, 350 to 540 megahertz. So this obviously can isolate two meter signal from a 440. Great. So let's hook it up and let's see what I get. So if I looked at what's in here, this diplexer, it looks something like this. You hook up the radio and there's two choices. So this is a parallel circuit. Going through some inductors, two meters. The capacitors ground the higher frequencies, 400 megs. And if you go through this socket, capacitor, 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 and the inductors are going to ground to the reverse. So, you know, one's a low-pass filter and one's a high-pass filter. So it should be that one radio could connect to two antennas, and I think that's one of the functions here. Or you could have one antenna connected to radios, either way you want to do it. All right, so I tested, what about the 2-meter port? What's getting through the 2-meter port? Okay, everything's getting through zero dB attenuation. The gain is zero. And look, here's uh, two meters. So two meters gets through port one, but look what happens. Boom. Big attenuation at about uh, 280 megahertz. And even over here at 440, the attenuation is about 35 dB. So, all right, so the isolation is about uh, 32 dB at that 440 megahertz frequency at my port that says hook your two meter antenna there. Let's see the other port. Oh, look at this one. Here's the 70 centimeter port. It says hook up to anything 350 to 540 megahertz. So the two meter stuff can't get through this. Look at this. The isolation is like 70, 65 dB. So two meter stuff can't get through here. But look, anything above about 300 megahertz, fine, fine, fine. So I thought, beautiful, oh, now I see how this thing works. So the coils and capacitors are just separating out the lower and the higher frequencies. And all that for a price of, you know, maybe 50 bucks or so. So someone was saying, I'm looking for a two meter antenna. So one radio that's a dual bander, you can go here to two separate antennas if you want to do that. All right, so let's continue, what else? Well, I've got uh, some antennas I want to test. So now how I test them with the nano VNA is I have channel zero sends a signal out and I wait for the signal to come back because I can't connect channel one to my antenna. Nothing's going through the antenna. It only has one port, the in port. Everything's supposed to radiate. So let's see what happens. So, all right, I have an antenna in my backyard that's a trap dipole. And it actually has just uh, two traps here, not four. I thought, can I build this with 40 meter traps so I can get 80 and 40 meters with one coax piece? 
After all, the expensive part was my coax, not the wire up here and stuff. So can I help with my nano analyzer build this antenna? Sure. So here's some traps that say they're 40 meter traps. Uh, these are made by a company called Unidillo. So I see the coil here. Where's the capacitor? I don't see a capacitor, except if you look, this uh, aluminum tubing is a different diameter than this one. So inside, these two conductors, the aluminum tubes, they don't touch. They're separated by an insulator. Here you can see the uh, insulator on this side. Oh, clever. So the capacitor is the coupling between this aluminum tube and this aluminum tube inside wherever the plastic, the dielectric is. So is this thing really tuned to 40 meters? Let's find out. So I hook it up and look at this, 40 meters, boom. Let's take a look at the whole antenna, what happens. Oh, so here's my dual band 80, 40 meter dipole and we're plotting SWR. So way up here, the SWR is 10 to one, yuck. Well, that's at three megahertz. I don't care, I can't operate there. How about three and a half megahertz? Oh, look at this beautifully. Uh, so the SWR three and a half is about two to one. That's pretty good. How about 3.6 megahertz? Oh, it's just about one to one. That's perfect. And that's where I like to operate a lot. So this antenna will work very well on the 80 meter band, maybe not so well at the higher parts of 80 meters where the SWR is around four. Nothing much here. Oh, look at 40 meters. Low SWR again, right at the bottom of the uh, 40 meter band, the CW part where I like to operate. So what am I discovering here? This little gadget called a trap, an LC parallel circuit, can give me two bands for the price of one. How about this? I've got this in my backyard. This is one of uh, my backyard verticals. Uh, Cushcraft R5, I've had it for maybe 35 years. It's a half wave, but it has these teeny ground plane wires, counterpoise as they call them. And it has a bunch of things up here that let you operate on more bands. And it also has some uh, wires up here that act as what they call capacitance hats. But what about these coils and capacitors up here? That's what I want to look at. How does that work? There's a 10, 15, uh, 10, 12, 15, 17 meter trap. Notice there's no 20 meter trap. How come? Hmm. So here's how Cushcraft makes their traps. So there's a coil, that's obvious, and there's a capacitor. The capacitor wasn't so obvious when you look at it, but the capacitor is two conductors separated by a insulator, the dielectric. And depending on how much overlap is here in the geometry of the diameters, that tells you the capacitance of the capacitor. So a capacitor and a coil in parallel, here's a resonant circuit, high impedance. So if I have these one and they're tuned to 10 meters, that means 10 meters, this is the end of the antenna, even if I've got stuff above it. How about if I set this up for 15 meters? All right, 15 meters, that's the end of that antenna. So these traps isolate or give you the terminating point for the 10, 12, 15, 17 meter band. Why don't I need one on 20 meters? Ah, because if this is my 17 meter trap, the 20 meter signal can get through the capacitor and I've got another three feet of uh, conductor up here which resonates it on 20 meters. So you don't need the 20 meter tap. The 20 meter band is set by what's above here. thought, oh that's really cool. Let's test it with my Nano VNA. Here it is. Uh, this is my Cushcraft R5. So, so remember the frequencies are low here. So here's 20 meters. Well look, the SWR at 12 megahertz is way up here 4 to 1. Well I don't care about that. I can't operate at 12 megahertz. So look what happens down here at about uh, 20 meters. The SWR is about one and a half to one. Good enough for me. Boom, 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 boom. How about uh, 18 megahertz? Oh, the SWR is about two and a half to one. Not great. I should probably tune that because I could get it down here. One of these capacitors or coils isn't set up quite right. How about 15 meters? Again, one of my coils or capacitors isn't quite right. I should take it down and readjust it. But oh heck, the SWR is about 1.8 to 1. Good enough for me. Here's uh, 12 meters. I've never operated on 12 meters. I, I tune and I never hear anyone on there. And here's 10 meters. Oh, really nice. Look at this. It's very broad banded here on, on 10. 
Oh, well, again, that was fun. I tested my Chriscraft R5 with my little $50 Nano VNA. Well, I got a whole bunch of two-band antennas. Uh, I've got one of these on my roof, and I've got one of these. It's in my basement. Now I got it at Kimberton. Uh, yet to test it, but I thought, well, let's test this. So this is this antenna. I think it's a uh, Comet. Uh, two meter, 70 centimeter. And look what I'm looking at here. When I test it on two meters on an expanded plot, oh, the SWR is less than two to one over almost the whole band. That's really good. Right in the middle, about 146, SWR is almost one to one. Ah, great. Whoops, here it is on 440, bouncing around a little bit, which is kind of interesting. But the SWR is down less than one and a half to one across the whole band. So I'm not going to worry about the bouncing around. Uh, I can use this anywhere. I can use this anywhere on 2 meters or 440, which is what it's designed to do. And I've got one of these. Uh, in fact, I've got four or five of these because people give them to me after they move or take them down or gets a little busted up. Very popular, 11 element beam on 2 meters, Cushcraft. Uh, very lightweight. It's got about 13 dB gain, so it's very nice. How does it match to coax? Well, it has one of these adapters. So coax goes in here, let's say 50 ohm coax. And here's a capacitor coupled to here. So depending on where you slide this and clamp this, you can change the impedance uh, ratio between 50 ohms and about you know 30 ohms for the antenna. So when you play with this, you try to get the SWR down. I thought, oh, let's, let's play with this with the Nano VNA. So here's my Nano VNA testing my own uh, 11 element Cushcraft beam. The first graph is the impedance. I didn't think it would bounce around that much. The impedance goes from about 30 ohms to about 110 ohms. Yikes. It bounces around. Here's the SWR. It looks a little more calm. But I'm thinking, oh, I bet I could improve that by adjusting that gamma match. But eh, it's been up and it works and I don't worry about it. But if I had to, I could probably take it down, tweak it to get the SWR a little flatter over the 2 meter band. It looks like it's... Uh, set up a little better for about 140 megahertz than 145. See, here's the impedance, about 50 ohms. So by playing with this thing, I could probably improve my antenna. But I guess I've just been lazy. All right, what else? All right, I'm watching the clock here. I don't want to go too much past uh, 830 here. So I've also got this antenna in my backyard. It's a uh, inverted V. It's a dipole. It's uh, not up all that high, but it's fed with about 150 feet of pretty good RG213. It's got a uh, current ballon on it. I haven't talked about ballons, but most of you know what a ballon does. But I want to know, uh, and it's fed with coax. Can I use this on any band? Hey, this is one of my best antennas. It's way up high and uh, fed with good coax. So let's use the Nano VNA and ping it from, let's say, 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz. What, what, what would I see? And here's that graph. So here's SWR, VSWR, 8 to 1. Well, that's not very good, but that's at 3 uh, megahertz. It's 5.6 to 1. Oh, I can't operate it 3 megahertz. Here's 80 meters. Oh, look at that. The SWR is almost 1 to 1. Perfect. Well, it is an 80 meter dipole, so I hoped it would work well. Can it work on 40? Well, here's 40 meter band right here. The SWR on 40 is about, uh, no, it's about 6.5 to 1. That's not very good. I don't think I'd try to operate this with a coax feed line on 40 meters. That would make it a full wave dipole, high impedance. That wouldn't work well. Of course, I could take away the coax and feed it with ladder line, but I didn't do that. Well, what else? Oh, look at this. This is a really low SWR at about what? A uh, little below 12 megahertz. That's fantastic. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have a ham license. My, I can't operate there. Uh, 12 megahertz isn't a ham band. All right, so here's uh, 20 meters. Nah, the SWR is four and a half to one. That's no good. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, wait a minute. Look at this. The SWR is almost one to one again. 19 megahertz. Oh, bummer. So what's happening here? The third harmonic <coughs> of three and a half megahertz, the third harmonic and the fifth <coughs> harmonic <coughs> are both low SWR, except they're not in the ham band, so that doesn't do me any good. So... Yeah, I kind of remember that. A center-fed dipole fed with coax. The resonant frequencies are, you know, a half a wave, three halves, five halves, seven halves. So uh, as I move up in frequency, I might get multiple locations, multiple resonances. 
but these aren't going to be very good with uh, uh, coax feed on the ham band. So how about 15 meters? Uh, the SWR is about two and a half to one. Yeah, I kind of remember that. Uh, I tried to operate there and I got a couple contacts, but my transmitter didn't like that. How about 10 meters? No, nah, that's not so good either. SWR is two to three to four to one or something. So I thought, well, yeah, I've just shown what I thought I knew ahead of time. An 80 meter center fed with coax dipole is really a single band antenna if I feed it with coax. Okay, so let's zoom in on 80 meters. Well, my nano VNA is really good for that. Now, I haven't talked about Smith charts. That's going to be part two. But here's my nano VNA from 3.5 to 4 megahertz. So I set up the software to start at 3.5 and, and stop at 4 megahertz. And I sample uh, every 65 uh, or 165 kilohertz. So I got a lot of samples here. So it takes me to do this sweep about one minute. But then I get six graphs <laughs> all at once. I uh, can't do that on my little nano VNA screen. So. Look at the Smith chart. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Here's the uh, S11 is the reflection coefficient. I'll talk more about that in the next talk. Return loss, that's what engineers use. Oh, look at this. A big loss at about 3,600 kilohertz. Perfect. That's where I like to operate the NB EMS digital net. SWR. <clears throat> well, I'm more comfortable with that. Look at the SWR. Two and a half to one at the bottom of the band and about uh, two and a half to one at 3,700. So down here at the bottom of the band, that's really good. Up at the top end of the band, the phone band, not so good. The SWR is three, four to one. What's this? Oh, look at this one. This is uh, R and X. What the devil is that? That's the resistance in blue and the reactance in whatever color this is. So we're going to come back to resistance and reactance in part two. But look at this odd graph, the phase. What is going on here? So I want to zoom in on these two graphs here. So let's look at this. Um, I pinged this antenna at 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 8, 9, and 4. Here are the markers. On a Smith chart, and I'll talk about this in more detail at the second talk in May, if, if I'm invited back, the bullseye I set for 50 ohms. I calibrated my VNA for 50 ohms bullseye. Marker 2, 3.6 megahertz, just about passes through the bullseye. So this antenna is going to really work well at 3.6 megahertz. Good, because that's near all the NB EMS nets. That's where I like to operate. How about 1? Well, 1's farther from the bullseye. 3 is farther. 4 or 5, 6 is really far. So I'm looking at this and thinking, well, you know, uh, position 2 is probably my ideal here, just from looking at how the resistance and reactance changes with frequency. Okay, we'll come back and look at reactants on a Smith chart in part two. Phase. Now, this is my doctor and my EKG. He said, Teacher Barry, that's what I was called at Westtown School. Teacher Barry, you got to learn about phase on your EKG. So each time I come back, I try to impress my cardiologist. So what is going on here? Phase. Well, first it's an angle. It's not ohms. It's an angle. Here's zero degrees phase, and I think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At resonance, the inductance and capacitance, the reactance, cancels. So I get a phase angle of zero degrees at my resonant frequency. Oh, I remembered that. I was so pleased. So what's happening here? Uh, the angle is negative. What's happening here? The angle's positive. But what's happening right here? What's this vertical line? Oh. So it's changing from being capacitive to inductive reactants. Oh, there's my phase graph. Now i got to figure out what this means on my heart. <laughs> but this is essentially showing me that what? The, uh, the resonant frequency where the reactance is zero is just about 3.6 megahertz. Perfect. That's where I wanted it. Oh, my nano VNA. Now I had to learn about phase. So now i got to learn more about my heart and my EKG. All right, so this antenna works great at the low end of the band, but wait a minute. I want to operate at the high end of the band sometimes. I rarely pick up a microphone on my HF rig, but when I do, there's a uh, HF net up around 3990, and I've got to be able to check into the uh, Eastern Pennsylvania Pima net, and I try to do that, and the SWR is like three or four to one. Ah, my radio doesn't like that. So what can I do? I want to be able to use this antenna. To operate at a higher frequency, what do I need to do? I know what I need to do. 
I need to cut off 10 feet of my antenna, but then it won't work at 3.6. So I'm not going to climb my antenna uh, tree and cut off wire. What can I do? What can I do? So one dipole has a resonant frequency on, let's say, the half wavelength. And if I'm too high or too low, if I QSY, I get into trouble either way. So what do we know here? If the dipole's too short, the current's leading the voltage. It's called capacitive reactance. And if the uh, frequency we're going to operate, like 3990, is above the resonant frequency, then my dipole's too long. I've got to cut it back. Or the current's lagging the driving voltage. The words aren't important. What's important here is we have a timing issue. Timing, what does that mean? I thought, this is the only way to explain phase and timing. Everybody knows, if you've got kids or grandkids, that you take them to the swing. Kid jumps on the swing. What's, what's Grampy's job? Grampy's job is, of course, push. How does Grampy know when to push? Well, even the kids know when Grampy's supposed to push. You push so you make the kid swing higher. But what does that mean? So the kid says, Grampy, Grampy, push in phase with my natural vibration on the swing. Well, she doesn't quite say it that way, but that's what she means. If I push too early, that's no good. She crashes into me. If I try to push too late, that's no good. I'm running after her. In either case, I've got a phase problem, right? Phase, phase, phase. So I want to cancel the reactance in my antenna without cutting the dipole or adding feet. How do I do that? I, I want to do it in my shack. I don't want to go climb the antenna. So what I need is a matching network. Okay, I remember that, matching networks. I didn't need them as a kid because I put up a 40-meter dipole. It worked on 40 and 15 meters, and I was happy, and I worked the world. Then I got my general, and I wanted to work it on 10 meters. Whoops, it wouldn't work. <laughs> I thought, all righty, all righty, how do I get a 10-meter antenna? Then I thought, no, I want to operate on 20 meters. I, my dipole wouldn't do that, so I had to learn how to put up either more antennas or one more versatile antenna. So the reactance in the antenna, I might be able to cancel by adding the opposite reactance down here in my shack. Ah, that's going to get us to phase two, because I don't want to go into too much detail about conjugate matches and how these things work. But basically what the matching network does in my shack is it makes the source, the transmitter, see no reflection. In other words, I adjust the knobs on this matching network, or I push the button and it does it for me. So my transmitter sees an SWR of 1 to 1. What does that mean? It means my transmitter sees 50 ohms resistance, no reactance in this cable. That's beautiful. My matching network makes my radio happy, makes me happy. I get contacts. Meanwhile, what's happening at the antenna? Nothing. It still allows the antenna to operate off frequency. But I don't care about that as long as I can get contacts. So this kind of a gadget, or something maybe a little simpler, is what I have in my shack. And I adjust the coils and capacitors. So my transmitter sees 50 ohms. And I thought, well, but I'm, you know, it means I got to tune up at 10 watts. I may interfere with a net. I'm transmitting. Can I do it with my nano VNA instead of my transmitter? Sure. So I have the nano VNA and the output here going through a tuner. On the other side of the tuner, I have the antenna. Now notice my transmitter is not connected. You don't put this device between your transmitter and your tuner. You burn it up in a second. So what do I do? I, I set this to ping on, let's say, uh, 3.99 megahertz, where I want to operate. So it just shows me the Smith chart and a cursor, and it's way off the bullseye. I adjust these three knobs, a capacitor, a coil, a capacitor. I adjust these three until this little cursor lands right in the bullseye, which means 50 ohms. Ah, then I disconnect this and I attach it to my transmitter. I've tuned up with just a milliwatt. I mean, I'm a net control operator on the Pennsylvania NBEMS net, 3583. I don't know how often in the middle of the net, this is Sunday mornings, the digital net, you got tuner uppers right on your frequency. I mean, I mean, give me a break. Couldn't you tune up two kilohertz above or below us, you know? So here's my antenna, my 80 meter antenna, and I tune up to 3,900 kilohertz by just wiggling and jiggling the knobs on the tuner. 
Now I take a Smith chart recording of it and look what happens. Here's 3.1, uh, 3.5 megahertz. Oh, that's way out here. 3.6, 7, 8, 3.9 megahertz. Oh, it's really close to the bullseye. The bullseye is the only spot where the SWR is one to one. Beautiful. Now my antenna's tuned up for the high end of the band. Well, 3,900. Can I now operate back at 3,600? No, because my SWR is down here. I'd have to wiggle and jiggle the tuner knobs and put it back to here. So basically the Smith chart is kind of in a clever one-shot deal, giving me the resistance and reactance over whatever frequencies I tested. And here I'm just testing 80 meters. So here's my retuned, my retuned antenna to 3900. So you just saw this graph. The SWR is down here. It's really lousy at the bottom of the band, but look at this. The SWR is one to one at about 3900. Well, that's what I want. So it means the SWR in my shack is that. The SWR at the antenna is still the lousy four to one. Here's the resistance and the impedance. Oh, no, wait a minute. Look at this thing. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember, we talked about phase. Where's the phase change occurring here at about 3,900 kilohertz? So I've moved the resonant frequency up kind of artificially with my tuner. I've moved it up to 3,900 kilohertz. I could say it this way. I've changed the resonant frequency of my antenna system, meaning the whole thing. The antenna itself, the wire, is still resonant, you know, wherever it was, 3,800. But by adding this antenna tuner in my shack, the whole system will now work well with my transmitter at the hop high end of the band. That's great. So this little gadget for 50 bucks, I thought, man, I'm having so much fun with this. It can measure resistance, reactance, impedance, phase. Now, I haven't talked much about these. This is the next hour. Reflection coefficient, return loss, SWR on the Smith chart. So what did you learn? Uh, just fundamentals about a Smith chart, unless you already knew about that, my 80 meter dipole. Phase, phase, phase. Every time I go back to my e uh, doctor, my uh, cardiologist, I want to try to impress him that I know a little bit more about phase. Last time, I think he gave me a ninth grader interpretation. I thought it's better than a third grader. And resistance reactance. So um, the question came up. So uh, do, do you have to have a resonant antenna to work out? No, no. Uh, I can make the whole antenna system resonant and work out, however. So a common antenna is just a long dipole, a doublet. 100 feet, 200 feet, throw it up in a tree. But feed it not with coax, feed it with a low loss balance line and have a kind of a tuner that can feed balance line. Tune these knobs or push a button so it tunes this whole system for whatever frequency you want, 80, 40, 20, 10 meters. This cable sees a low uh, impedance, 50 ohms, no reactance. So the radio is happy. The radio sees a one-to-one -one SWR, as long as I've got this antenna tuning unit doing its thing. So here's the common antenna that's an all-band, all-mode, just does everything well. You know, 130 feet, center-fed with, uh, and ladder line's cheaper than coax. The only thing about ladder line is you don't want to get it wet. You don't want to crank it. You don't want to have it blowing in the wind. You don't want to have the squirrels and the birds land on it and on and on and on. So I use a ladder line for about two years and then I replaced it with coax. <laughs> I'd rather, uh, you know, put up more antennas than. But anyway, uh, probably some of you use uh, balanced homemade ladder line or window line. The antenna tuner here, that's the key. Of course, you've got to get this to compensate for the reactance up here. Uh, a lot of people just throw a long wire into a tree and treat it like a random wire and then tune it, get the reactance, tune it with your antenna tuner working against ground. Uh, this is a little trickier. Maybe some of you have this thing working uh, because then your ground is part of it, uh, your counterpoise. Sometimes you get it working on one band, you switch bands and you get RF in the shack. Uh, you touch your microphone, you get a little tingly shock. <laughs> that happened to me a lot. So I had an N-fed half-wave antenna up for about three years. I finally took it down. Uh, long story. So part two, I'm going to stop here, and it's already an hour here. So part two, the nano VNA and looking under the hood, 
that gets us into a little more of the math, which shouldn't scare too many of you. So let me unclick here. Stop sharing. Oh, and I, oh, I wanted to share one more thing. I've got a live. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Here's a live reading right now of my 80 meter antenna. Uh, so look at this. Uh, do I have the tuner in line? No. So here's my 80 meter antenna and it's tuned up for about 3600 kilohertz, very low SWR. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a, um, a antenna tuner and turn it on and then do another sweep and see what happens. All right, so a couple of things just changed here. I'm going to randomly turn a knob and sweep again. I'm not doing anything scientifically here. So look what I just did. I just lowered the resonant frequency way down here below 3.5 megahertz. Let me make the thing go the other way. I'm just randomly playing with my antenna tuner. Oh, look what I did. That was kind of cool. So now it's tuned up for about 3.7 megahertz. Not quite. So I'm changing the resistance, the reactance, the impedance, changing all kinds of things. I better stop here because my voice is leaving. And I think if I look at you, I don't know if I put you to sleep. So <laughs> there's resistance, reactance, impedance, and the Smith chart, save for the May talk, if I'm invited back. Sure. <laughs> great. Thanks, Barry. That, that was a great talk, and we will have you back on May 21st for uh, for part two. <laughs> okay. Great. So are there any questions? I know well, who, I who has one? I bet some of you already have one. Uh, I do. I just kind of used to check uh, SW rowers on my uh, antenna and playing with antennas, but other than that, I haven't gone that deep into it. Well, it's a very good antenna analyzer if... You calibrate it. Did you calibrate it? Uh, yes, it, it came with the shunt and the uh, dummy yep. load. Yep. And uh, I went through that. And, and you calibrated on what frequencies? I tried on for 10 meters. Okay. And um, that's because ha the antenna I have is for 10 meters. So. Someone asked me, why can't you just calibrate it from 1 to 500 megahertz? You can. But then the problem is... That's a lot of calibration points, and you can't save that on the Nano VNA. You can save it on your computer as a file. So I did a couple of those, and they were like 300K, 400K files. I stored a two-port S1, S2, two-port, 1 to 500 megahertz, and I said take uh, something like 50 samples, time, 50 times 100, uh, 5,000 samples. And I thought that was enough, 1 to 500 megahertz. And it took about two minutes to actually do the sweep. And it took like, you know, three seconds to save the file. But then I can recall the file. So when you calibrate, you want to calibrate this thing with your standards over some particular narrow frequency range to get better precision. Why don't you have to do that with the MFJ analyzers? That, that was a good question. Dennis is about to tell us. Well, because their reflectometers are built on a totally different principle. Okay. Um, so one, one of the issues is when you calibrate this thing, um, what are you teaching it? So in a sense, you're teaching it what's, what's a uh, zero ohm you know, conductor between the two ports, what's an infinite ohm, and what's a 50 ohm, no reactance. I can calibrate it, although I haven't tried it yet, and some people suggest that I do this. Uh, Calibrate it, let's say, on 75 ohms, because some people use 75 ohm coax. Or calibrate it on 600 ohms, like some of the microphone circuits. Uh, you can calibrate it with any standard you want, but then it moves the Smith chart according to the bullseye. So, Dennis, I, I'm assuming that was about a fifth or sixth grade talk that I... It was very good. <laughs> I want to compliment you. I think, I think you did a good job. Uh, diplexers and duplexers... Yeah, a little, little bit of computing. They're both three-port devices, but generally speaking, diplexers have uh, the capability of like connecting. I've got a six-meter output on my TS590, and I've got a 
six, um, two and four forty vertical. So they're so diplexers. A, so I have a diplexer coming from the five ninety, and then I've got the other port coming from my dual band or feeding the same antenna. That's right, and about. duplexers so, are what you find in repeaters. And duplexes are basically the same thing, except you have a separate transmitter and receiver as opposed to like two different uh, transceivers. And that costs and, thousands of dollars. <laughs> and well, they're also designed to be a lot closer in frequency and designed basically to do cross attenuation. The transmitter is attenuated on the receiver and the receiver is a transmitter on the um, attenuator. So and my the, little comment on the label says duplexer. So right. the manufacturer didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I, let me tell you, the same thing happened when people said Modems and board rates. He said the same thing, and that wasn't oh. right either. But yeah, right. yeah. Do you have one of these, Dennis? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes. How do you use yours? Um, how do I use? I've, I've done basically what you've done. I've looked at a couple of different um, uh, what are called cable combiners. I do some ah. some interesting things with uh, building uh, parallel transmitters and things like that out of MOSFET power MOSFETs. So you build these cable combiners, which is basically just a uh, a series of RG174U, the real thin coax that you basically connect two transmitters together easily. And as part of like traditional engineering courses, would students learn how to operate vector no, they network learn, they analyzers? Learn nothing, they learn nothing at all because everything is artificial intelligence and software. Nobody cares about RF anymore. Oh, wow. That's a problem, isn't it? <laughs> it will well, be a problem. It will be a problem if they get a job where they have to do RF, but they yeah, don't. So that's, yeah. that's the way it goes, you know. I used to, even with ninth grade physics, I had fun. I would take a box, and inside the box was something. Uh, I mean, not like a transistor. Either resistors, coils, capacitors. And I would give the kids a little, back then it was a little heat kit oscillator, audio oscillator, and uh, a current meter and a voltmeter. And anyway, they could measure the voltage going into this box and the current going through and in and out. And from looking at what happens when they change the frequency, they had to at least figure out roughly what's in the box. So the hardest was if the box was, you know, like 10 ohms, you know, because they got a lot of current and nothing changed, you know. But if I had just uh, an inductor, just uh, what I did was take apart a lot of speaker, what do you call those, crossover networks. So I just had a lot of, you know, coils of wire, you know, two, three, five millihenry coils. And the kids, when they went from 100 hertz, up to you know a thousand hertz they see the current went down so they knew what was in the box passes low low frequencies but not high frequencies so they said eh, it's some kind of coil you know <laughs> so that's as far as we got with ninth grade physics but they used to call it impedance they didn't like to call it impedance well i don't want to give you any more things to play with but when i did <laughs> teach the um, second course electromagnetics which has now been defunct nobody wanted to take it it was called um, antennas of propagation and we actually modeled wire antennas using the NEC code, the numerical electromagnetics code. And if you oh, haven't played it. with that, you could spend the next three years just uh, modeling antennas with that software. And it's all available at uh, either low cost or freeware these days. Do students today learn about Smith charts? Nope, absolutely not. Uh, the, course, oh, uh, yeah. the course was a second course electromagnetics and it hasn't run for probably 15 years or so. You know, if how about Sim City or Sim, whatever it's called, the simulation of this chart? You can do it all in software. Huh? Well, I mean, when we last, well, when we last did, uh, well, actually, when I started to teach Smith charts in the 1980s, yes, we had a compass and a straight edge and a piece yeah. of paper. Yeah, fine. Yeah. And slide uh, rules. <laughs> well, uh, Ten years later, we all had um, uh, freeware software, and I've got about eight different versions here on my hard drive if you're interested in that but oh wow they're, they're kind of interesting they they work and they do the point but um now the students were not uh, interested they all went off into different areas yeah. the course gets um as they say disassembled uh, did you ever see a smith chart slide rule no i don't think i have k5 hal cullen i said please 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 like you know put this in your will i would love to have that um, and he's laughing. He'll still just send it to me. Uh, well, he's he's have, one of I the still, senior members of the Chester County Aries Races Group. Wonderful I have, guy. Uh, I still have a file full of the K and E, not only Smith charts but the expanded sh Smith chart that were like on these filmy papers and printed oh, wow. in, or in orange. Yeah. So that that was. But that's All right. Well, past. we're showing our retro experience. Other questions? Yes. Sir. When you make the uh, the graphs, I mean, is that all done in that software program? Yes. Or can you show them on the screen as well, like if you're working in the field? I can do that live 
next time. I I do have it live right now, but yeah, if I well, uh, yeah, let me do that next time. Right. You know, it would really be cool if if a number of you actually bought this and you had it, and the next May's talk was okay. Let's all set it up and calibrate and do it all at once. You know, together. Actually, that that's kind of my next question. I'm on Amazon right now looking at Nano VNA. Yeah. You could give some uh, pointers about what I might want to buy. Well, I didn't buy mine, but from folks, I've given like this talk to 10 different clubs. And what I hear, whoops. Yeah. Oh, you're showing. I was going to say, I just lost the picture. Yeah. What I hear is Amazon's are pretty reliable and RNL Electronics are pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. But mine came last uh, September. So as you go down, the bestseller, that one bestseller has N connectors, I think. Slide down. Yeah, that one, bestseller. Okay. Now, it's 130 bucks. So are you willing to pay a little more money? It goes up to 3 gigahertz. I don't care about that. I don't do anything up there. But it's got N connectors, and it's probably a little bit larger screen, I think. They come out now with 4-inch screens. There's a lot of knockoffs. So uh, it's probably safe buying things from Amazon. I, I would say that. Yeah. Like, what's the difference between the $62 and the $54? I have no idea. I didn't buy any. <laughs> I never bought Maybe this. Maybe it's the software versions that are different? No, it comes out of a different factory in China. So, hey, well, on, on eBay, the uh, not up through 900 megahertz ones are going for like $39. Hmm. Yeah, just pick one up at Kimberton, Jeremy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Some guy selling it out of the back of his truck. Um, yeah, okay, Ned. I just saw Ned's. 73 popped up um i think if i were gonna if i were gonna buy one i'd buy one with the end connector and uh the biggest screen they had but again i'm colorblind so and i would not likely use it without a computer next to me even the laptop because i can well i i did show you i can get six graphs at once in you know like if i want to check a um you know like a two meter 440 antenna I could not look, I don't want to just look at the SWR. I don't need this gadget to do that. But if I look at the resistance, the reactance, the phase, I can tell you, I can tell you what's wrong with the antenna if the SWR is three to one. I can't tell you what's wrong with an MFJ meter. And the MFJ meters are still a couple hundred bucks. I would suspect uh, anyone selling these at Kimberton, like maybe you guys, <laughs> you know, buy a 10 of them and sell them for ten dollar markup <laughs> so. Is it, so this thing can operate either standalone like if you're in the field just take yes. it out or you could tether it to the computer you can save five calibrations on the one i have you can save five calibra oh you know what else it came with no instructions i had to go online to get all the instructions yeah it's paid for a price um yeah you can operate it with i think the newest ones now have 200 data points that doesn't bother me because I would use it on 80 meters or 20 meters or two meters. I don't want to look at it from four to 500 megahertz. I, that would serve me no purpose. It was fun to look at a J-pole. The J-pole antenna really was pretty good. And I, and I bought that for 10 bucks, I think three or four years ago at Kimberton. On my way out, someone had a couple of junky two meter antennas. And I said, you're gonna have to lug that all the way back, you know. And he had a two meter four element uh, I think it was an old Telrex beam from like the 1960s. Nice antenna. And one of these J poles that were made out of half inch copper pipe looked like homemade. And I said, are you going to lug all those back? He said, no, make me an offer. I said, 10 bucks for both of them. He said, sold. <laughs> so, you know, I, on my way leaving Kibberton, I bought two antennas. When we used to have our Mark auctions, which we haven't had one in a while, I used to be the auctioneer, and when nobody was bidding on something, I used to say, I'll give you a dollar if you take it. And I was the auctioneer. <laughs> I took advantage of a couple of those. <laughs> well, I, I, I went to Kimberton after I retired because as I left Westtown School, I had accumulated, uh, I mean, Dennis would smile at this, like four or five giant Tektronix oscilloscopes, the 535s, 545s. They had, these had like... 20 tubes, it was like 500 watts, you know, when you plug it in. But they were gorgeous lab-grade instruments from the 1960s. So I retired in 2011. So the physics teachers that we were following me at West End didn't want any of this, you know, junk crap, they called it. So I said, all right, so I 
took it all home. I put it all in the back of my pickup truck. Had like four Tektronics oscilloscopes, a big HP oscilloscope, uh, just all kinds of stuff that was just big and bulky. All tube stuff, obviously. Signal generators. And I pull in. I didn't have the back on my truck, so it was all open. So I pull in, you know, right near the, the opening there, nice spot. I stand up on my truck and I yell, everything in this truck is free, free, free. So, you know, the hordes come. And, uh, you know, in about three minutes, it was all gone. And one guy took a beautiful turntable and something else. And he said, here's 20 bucks. I said, I don't want any money. He said, I can't take it without giving you something. Will you take 20 bucks? I said, okay. He said, go out for lunch. You know, I said, okay. So I took us $20. But I just Barry, unloaded a truckload of stuff in minutes. Barry, you should have opened up the Tektronix because they had a roll of silver solder in there. And that was worth about 20 bucks. Oh, my gosh. I had replaced, you know, I knew every tube in that thing. You know, and one or two tubes were really odd ones. Barry, I've got a, a question for you as a physics teacher. If you have an, an oscilloscope, the Empire State Building, and a stopwatch, how do you measure the uh, gravitational acceleration? Okay, you can't do it? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, the stopwatch is easy. Just drop it. Oh, yeah, yeah that, just drop that's it. That's a joke. You throw oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Without the stop off the uh, Empire yeah, State okay. Building, just time how long and before it hits the ground. Yeah, that's good. If you throw the stop, start the stopwatch and then throw it, and it probably will break and freeze no, no, at the time. You don't want to throw the stopwatch. <laughs> that's much more valuable than your oscilloscope. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's another little toy too, which I demonstrated at a meeting many years ago, and that's a little embedded computer, which is actually a bolt beater and an oscilloscope, and that's available in the kit. I think they're still available out there. That's a nice little piece of equipment if you don't have anything at all in the shack because good enough for audio work or whatever. It's unbelievable yeah. considering what it is. It was like 20 bucks or something. So, I, vis nice I visited Swarthmore nice in about... Kits out there. I visited them. Swarthmore in about 2005 before I retired and I sat in on some of their labs and I knew their lab tech very well. This is Marianne, uh, Jeremy. And um, I was describing to her one of my ninth grade labs where I had, you know, what's in the box? And she said, that, that was very clever. So the next year, Swarthmore had a lab. What's in the box for their, you know, uh, intro physics courses? And you know, it was still, you know, AC sound, so there was nothing dangerous about it. And she hooked up a little uh, speaker so you could hear the tones you were using. But she made a couple little complicated circuits with, uh, you know, series and parallel. And it was really nice if you put a series, uh, series you know, inductor and capacitor, like, I don't know, 10 microfarads and a couple of millihenries, and you sweep like 100 hertz barely gets through, and 500 hertz, 600 gets really loud, and you go up to like 1,000, 2, 3,000, and it, the frequency goes, frequency goes up, the sound goes down, so it's like the mid-range speaker, so it goes, you know, and the kids had to figure out what's in the box by what sounds came through the box, so the speaker was in series with the, the network. Very clever. <laughs> Barry, uh, circuits and electronics education in 2021 is all done virtually. There's a program called Multisim. Basically, you build on the screen and you have simulated oscilloscopes, power supplies, whatever it is. You just, everything's done in simulation. Nothing is done with real world components, whiteboards, or breadboarding, or anything anymore. Yeah. See, when I taught ninth grade, it was almost all hands on. And man, could they burn out batteries and fuses. And after a while, I started to charge them. 25 cents per fuse you burn out. Then they got a little more careful. <laughs> they wanted to know, what's it like if you burn out a battery with a direct short? I said, well, here's a D cell. Let's just burn one of them out. So, you know, you can all smell it. So they did, and, you know, then, <laughs> You ever hear the problem where somebody puts a 9-volt battery in their pocket with some coins, and it shorts the 9-volt battery oh, out, and next oh, thing you know, your oh. pants is on fire. Oh, nasty. <laughs> So here's a question. I mean, a lot of the stuff you do with the nano VNA is similar to what you can do with, you know, one of these, uh, you know, antenna analyzers, which, you know, they do the same thing, but they cost a lot more. I mean, what would be the advantage of buying one of the antenna analyzers or should I just get a, a nano VNA? I would suspect these nano VNAs, if they're under $100 or about $100, uh, I would bet there are many fewer, you know, rig expert $500 antenna analyzers being sold now. I mean, 
as long as you calibrate this thing, it's just as accurate as the... Well, I don't know. I ha I've had experience with one rig expert, W3EOC, the Chester County Emergency Operations Center, has a rig expert uh, 600, goes up to 600 megahertz. And I was the station manager, so I had to learn how to use it. So I took it home, read the instructions. That was really nice, but it was $600. So it's 600 hours to test, you know, uh, an antenna on the township building or something, be sure it works. Well, I could have done that with my HT, just, you know. But uh, I think because it can measure phase, and I'm still learning about it, so. Um, all of those devices, no matter what they are, they're all re reflectometers. We used to build them out of pieces of coax where you put a enameled wire underneath the shield and had a diode at each end. So it's called a classical reflectometer. So all they did was MFJ and all they, they just put in a variable oscillator and two reflectometers that'll work over the ranges. And- uh, But some of the MFJs can measure inductance and capacitance. Well, that that's, they just set up a weak stone bridge. That's all they did. Right. I think their test frequency is like 50 kilohertz or something as I recall, so. Yeah, that was interesting, uh, Jeremy, what you just mentioned. If you have a capacitor, let's say, and it says, uh, you know, 0.01 microfarad or something, would that vary if you tried it at different frequencies? Is the capacitance of a capacitor a function of the frequency you tested it? Sure. Well, here with this little gadget, you can figure it out. <laughs> you can test yeah. it. And it depends on the length of your leads and all now. So I never play with the thing at really high frequencies, but. I just had fun today playing with a couple of filters that I had, and I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. You know, I rarely test anything above two meters, so 150 megahertz. It looks like the cheap one goes up to 1.5 gigahertz. Three gigahertz now is the standard, you know, the gold standard kind of. That's for the $100 one. Yeah. I'd it's spend $50 more for a good one. Basically, the $500 antenna analyzer, I guess the main thing is that it'll be easier to use. You just kind of take it out of the box, plug it in, and it gives you what you need without much configuration. There's Do you drive thing. a stick shift or an automatic? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> same thing, same thing. My said, truck my truck is a six-speed <laughs> stick. Did the instructions were useful, though, the ones that you found? No, no. Uh, a lot of people, once I've given this talk, a lot of people have said, why don't you write better instructions? I said, well, I don't have fun doing that. Plus, if I make mistakes, then you're going to yap at me. And, you know, they're probably all a little different. Um, the Nano VNA Saver software saved my life. It was very intuitive. It was, oh, it's free. <laughs> Nano VNA Saver. It, it works on Windows 10. I don't know if it'll work on other platforms. Um I've had a lot of fun with the one that was sent to me. I offered to give it back because I've played with it enough to the club. And the guy who bought it for me said, no, keep it. It's meant to be a present. And he said, you know, you've taught us so much about it in the last six months. You know, we've we've earned our you've earned your keep or whatever the word is. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it away at Kimberton. <laughs> so, yeah. Are there any other questions for Barry? All right, let's thank uh, Barry for a great uh, presentation. That was fun. Well, Not too many of you left, but that was fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks to those joining us on uh, YouTube as well. So does anyone have anything else uh, for the good of the organization? Nope. All right, then we'll declare this uh, meeting